We're still on topic four, but before we look at topic four, I want to um, take up the test. So test number two, if you haven't noticed already, I've graded it on Moodle. So I wanna go over the answers now and, um, and see how we did. Uh, some people need to study a little bit more. Open book is not necessarily mean easy uh, and uh, you must practice the problems. It's very, very important you practice the problems. Uh, calculations are not something, you know, they, they just come to people. Everyone needs practice in doing these things. Uh, first question. It says you've got the pH of orange juice is 3.5 and the concentration of uh, the hydrogen ion as a cola is, is this number, which of the statements is not true. So this one here, you have to, um, you have to turn to pH to see if, um, if this is uh, uh, consistent, right? And um, it is not, I don't have the number at the moment. I guess I don't have my calculator with me either. Um, but that's the one that is incorrect. All the rest are incorrect. Uh, so sodium bicarbonate. Uh, bicarbonate, remember, is the uh, conjugate base of carbonic acid. So it's technically a base and can neutralize the, the acidity of the orange juice and the, uh, and the cola. So that one just took a little bit of a uh, couple of number crunching to make sure everything was okay. Uh, number two. So what does not affect pH? So pH is the hydrogen ions of concentration. CO2 makes carbonic acid. Hydroxide is a base, so that definitely affects the, uh, the pH. Bicarbonate is a base. So the correct answer is this, when you're adding just a salt solution to solution, it does not affect the pH. Uh, dissolved oxygen, this is right in the notes in terms of what the, tr the trends are with dissolved oxygen. And uh, so dissolved oxygen, um, of course, increases as temperature decreases. That's the trend, remember. And the other ones are kind of the opposite, right? Obviously, dissolved oxygen affects fish. Fish need it to breathe. Uh, number four, which of the following is incorrect? Um, so CH4 is the incorrect one. This is actually methane. And methane is produced by, uh, by archaea. So remember, archaea are not bacteria. Archaea are... Um, or the, uh, the third domain of organisms. Uh, number five, alkalinity is the quantitative capacity to neutralize the base to a designated pH. Um, that's actually the opposite. Um, that's the definition of acidity. Alkalinity is the ability to neutralize an acid, right? So acids and bases are the opposite. Alkaline is the opposite of acidic. Number six, uh, most common symptoms are vomiting and diarrhea. So intestinal cramps might come along, but less common than diarrhea. And number seven is true. Colloids basically produce turbid water. They're large structures. And diarrheal diseases are a leading cause of child death in developed countries. Okay, let's talk about the short answer here. Um, this one here turned out to be a little harder than I thought it was going to be, considering I had gone over it at least a couple of times in the lecture notes. Um, I went through it at the very beginning of, uh, of topic four and told you there'd be a few things asked about it on topic four. Uh, so the sources of fecal matter, basically humans and animals, and we can divide the animals into two types, uh, agricultural animals or uh, wild animals, right? Uh, so three things, right? Agricultural runoff, um, human sewage, and uh, wild animal fecal matter. Number 10, disadvantages of hard water. I think actually everybody got that one. Um, sometimes it leads to a taste. Sometimes it leads to uh, um, uh, properties in foods, like uh, if you make a tea out of hard water, sometimes it's uh, a little bit more cloudy than, than soft water and things like that. Okay, so this one here, notice it says with chemical equations, there are some people that uh, didn't quite fully explain what was going on here. Okay, uh, I think most people got the first equation, but just giving me an equation is enough. You also have to explain, okay? So explain that carbon dioxide is producing carbonic acid. And obviously carbonic acid is gonna decrease pH. Some people went further and showed the breakdown of carbonic acid and that's awesome. So now what does photosynthesis do? Photosynthesis basically 
removes carbonic acid from the water by removing CO2, because it basically bumps this equilibrium in this direction and then removes the CO2. Okay, so that needed an explanation too. I didn't necessarily uh, expect a, uh, a formula for part two, um, but at least a decent explanation. This was two marks. So a lot of people got one mark because so they didn't fully explain things or missed the second part of the question. All right, so the big question, the water analysis. Um, let's go through this, okay? So keep in mind that uh, the molecular mass was not important. And uh, I think everybody got the first part of the calculations correct. You're basically dividing the concentration divided by, or you're taking the concentration and dividing it by the equivalent weight to get the milliequivalents per liter. And uh, that was part one worth one mark. Um, number two, draw a bar graph. This is what it should look like. You should have the cations and anions uh, separated. You should have things labeled nicely. It does say state the scale. Some people did not do that. They did not state the scale. And you should be doing this with a ruler and you should have the units in there, okay? Anytime you're making a graph, all those are important things, right? You have it properly labeled, you have the proper units, and it is neat and tidy. So you want full marks for things, you gotta make sure you follow those kind of instructions. I think most people had the right idea, but some people lost marks for not including things that were expected. Uh, sulfates, I think most people got this. One or two people had a couple of weird answers uh, by throwing charges in there. Um, this is just a very straightforward basic chemistry. Sulfate has a two charge, so the potassium should have two potassiums and so on. If you uh, had troubles with that question and you wanna ask about it, please let me know. Okay, so the balance error, um, do make sure if you are, uh, uh, if you're not careful with, if you're, if you're, if you're rounding things off too much, uh, you're not being careful about significant digits, uh, some people end up with some numbers that were a little different. I think some of end up with 1.8. Um, that's where you're not being careful with those kind of things. Uh, but basically looking for the calculation and, uh, and then that's for, for one mark and then one mark for an explanation. Very few people gave me an explanation. There are probably countless explanations uh, as long as I was looking for something reasonable. One of the biggest ones is probably just due to rounding. And, and the second main reason is errors in testing. A third reason might be other things that haven't been tested for and are gonna to contribute to either the anions or the cations. For example, iron isn't always tested for. And of course it's a cation and it's gonna make the cations look smaller than, than the total amount. Okay, hardness. Um, hardness, of course, is adding up calcium and magnesium. And then you have a total hardness, which is this value here. Then you can revert to uh, milligrams per liter calcium carbonate by multiplying by 50. And this is the answer that you should have had. And it also asks you to rate it compared to the scale, and the scale says very hard. But I think 180, uh, greater than 180 is very hard according to that scale. Alkalinity is bicarbonate and carbonate, and basically the same idea, you add them up, get the total alkalinity, multiply by 50, and then you're gonna get uh, 330 milligrams per liter calcium carbonate. Make sure you have the correct units. You will lose marks if you don't have units in there. Anyway, uh, it was, uh, this test was all over the map. I think uh, different people had um, different things going on in terms of uh, what they had studied. Do make sure you study for the tests. There is always gonna be calculations on these tests uh, and always other parts to it. Okay, uh, the other thing is, I guess the, um, the government had announced yesterday about restrictions changing. I have not heard anything about that, uh, from that regarding uh, what's going on at the college. So for the time being, make sure that you do, um, just follow what the protocols we have been doing, bring your masks and all those kind of things until we hear otherwise from the college. I'm assuming there's gonna be an announcement uh, in the next day or two regarding what's going on with that, whether we're gonna be meeting in person or maybe it's after the reading week or I have no idea. Uh, I'm not in the loop on that one, but keep, uh, uh, keep checking your piano emails for any changes in that. And I will, um, if there's any significant changes, I will also echo that with an email to the, the group um, in a class email. Uh, the other thing before we move on 
is, uh, and maybe I would, wouldn't mind some comment on this, is tomorrow there is no lab. And, um, but we do have that time for a uh, lab report consultation. And so if you choose to do that, that's, you, get a, you get basically an extra 5% uh, on, your, on your lab report. Um, so I, uh, the question I have to you is, um, I can just have Zoom on all morning and you can pop in or you can book a time. Uh, does anyone have a preference on that? I was wondering if I can just email it and yeah. then and then. Um, yes, email is fine. Although I, I it would be nice to to speak to you as well because um, it's just easier than than uh, uh, typing a lot of stuff up uh, kind of thing. But if you want to email it to me in advance and then and then uh, the meeting would probably be a lot shorter in the end. Do you guys prefer popping in or do you prefer um, scheduling a time? Nobody has a preference? All right, well, I'm gonna be on Zoom from nine to 12 tomorrow. Uh, you can email me your, what you have and, uh, and then meet with me um, when you pop in and, uh, and we'll talk about what you have. Uh, I'm not looking for a massive amount. If you only have a little bit, that's fine. I will give 5% as a participation mark no matter what. If you don't meet with me, you don't get that 5% on the, on, the, uh, on the report. But you have to have something, at least a title. Um, yeah, so if, if, you, if I don't answer the Zoom right away, it probably means I'm on with another student. And uh, just hang on the line and I'll, uh, I'll get to you eventually. Uh, probably you won't be waiting more than, than 5 or 10 minutes. All right. So moving on back to topic four, and uh, let's see where we left off. Um, so we uh, we talked about waterborne diseases, and we talked about uh, E. coli. We talked about Giardia, Cryptosporidium. Uh, we talked about Hepatitis A, Norovirus, and um, we talked a little bit about um, Swimmer's Itch. And um, today we're going to talk about algae. Uh, algae aren't usually making you sick, although they can sometimes. We'll kind of you know, talk about that a little bit. Uh, but before we get there, I realized there was, uh, I think, this last slide here. Uh, I think I had covered that slide for sure. But um, this slide here, I can't recall whether I covered or not, which I meant to last day. And it basically says, what can we do about these things, right? Uh, a big part of this, what we do, is water treatment, right? Uh, we treat our water so that when we drink it or, or use it for food and whatnot, it's not going to, uh, not going to make us sick. Uh, that being said, it's also important that people, uh, you know, do other things like clean up after their animals. We protect our uh, drinking water sources from wild animals and those kind of things. And, um, you know, for camping and things like that, sometimes it means we have to boil our water or use tablets. To treat the water uh, kind of depends on the context. I do a lot of camping and I rarely treat the water. Um, but then again, it depends on where you go. Um, last summer, I went to uh, camp I went camping in a place that was a lot more swampy. And that was a case where I decided it was probably better to use the tablets. Uh, you don't know what kind of animals are swimming around in that swamp, leaving uh, fecal matter. But that was kind of a rare event for me. Uh, and, and you can see lots of other tips there. This is all from Alberta on water services or water services, Alberta Health Services, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, that was part A. Now the rest of these are a lot shorter and I'm pretty sure we'll finish all of this today. Uh, and we already talked about D, which is biochemical oxygen demand. Um, B, we wanna talk about analysis of water. So we were in uh, our last topic, we were talking a lot more about chemical analysis. So hardness and ions and things like that. Uh, another part of water analysis of which we did last week in the lab is we did that coliform test. That was kind of that test we did at the very end. And uh, so what I would want to do is kind of talk about that for a little bit. And um, I guess I meant to talk a little bit about the reports. And so maybe I'll try to save some time at the end today as well to talk a little bit about the reports. Um, so uh, microbiology analysis, basically what we're doing is looking for bacteria in the water. And specifically, we're looking for a type of bacteria called coliforms. 
So you can see right there on the slide, coliforms. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to do these kind of tests. Uh, I've seen quite a variety of tests and it kind of depends on what's being tested and the standards change and there's new methods. Uh, you can see this is one method where um, this is a, a flask with a vacuum attached to it. And what you can do is you can put a, a lot of water into that. So in that case, you could put hundred liters and filter it all through and you're gonna catch on the filter, um, you're gonna catch the bacteria. And then you can test them to see what kind of bacteria they are. Uh, here's some images of this kind of apparatus. The filter is, is basically right there. You can see they're putting a sample in there. You could put one liter, a hundred liters, you know, whatever it is that your, your test is, is asking for. Now this particular test, you can see what they do is they take the filter and they're putting it on a, um, on a Petri dish of some sort. And you can see that there's two types of water. They tested the tap water. Uh, there's no growth of organisms and the stream water, we have some growth of organisms. And usually there's some sort of colorized indicator in there to, uh, to say that there's certain types of bacteria in there. And they're looking for this coliform bacteria, which I wanna talk about here. I think the next slide is actually talking about what that means. Uh, there's, a, there's another slide showing another test. Uh, so these coliforms, let, let's talk about what those are. Um, it basically means bacteria, so cola, okay, right? Cola is really short form for what? colon, right? And colon is your, your large intestine. And that's really what it's saying. So coliform bacteria are basically a group of bacteria of which many of them live in the colon, which basically means they're in your feces. So sometimes uh, they'll break it down and talk about total coliforms. And total coliforms, if you look at this uh, classification, it says that they're gram negatives and they're lactose fermenting, right? So that's kind of means a certain group of organisms basically, right? The fecal coliforms are really just the ones that live in feces. And we're talking about warm blooded animals uh, in particular. Uh, so birds and mammals for the most part. Not that reptiles and amphibians don't poop, but uh, uh, they don't generally have these fecal coliforms. And often what we mean is E. coli. So why E. coli? E. coli is just really easy to grow in the lab. And that's it. That's why we know so much about E. coli and that's why we're always growing E. coli in the labs because it's super easy to grow. And the presence of E. coli indicates you may also have fecal matter. So this is kind of a really easy test to do to look for fecal matter. If you find E. coli, probably means there's fecal matter there. And that's kind of just the end of the story. Uh, we can't, we're not gonna test for everything. We can't just go around testing for hepatitis A and, and norovirus and and polio and whatever, okay? Uh, not all those things are necessarily gonna be present. Hepatitis A will be there if there's a hepatitis A outbreak, and we may test for it in that, in that uh, circumstance, but E. coli is there if there's feces there, right? So it's kind of a good indicator that there might be feces, and if there's feces, there might be other pathogens that are gonna make us sick. So it's kind of one of those quick tests to say, hey, let's look for feces, we're gonna do that, by looking for, um, for coliform bacteria. Uh, this is just another uh, kind of classification of these things. You can see it's talking about all sorts of uh, pathogens. So uh, uh, you can see there, there, there's a uh, gram positives there. And, and really, like I said, you're kind of zeroing in on these fecal coliforms, which um, are present. Every time that feces is present, you're gonna find those fecal coliforms, which is basically means E. coli. Uh, there's a little cartoon I found, and as you can see, it says fecal coliform bacteria at play, and they're talking about having the beach to themselves. Um, yeah, there's E. coli at the beach, always, every time. Just think about all the, all the animals that go through there. Usually not in very big numbers, usually not enough to make anybody sick. So if you ever hear about anybody complaining that there's E. coli at the beach, there's always E. coli at the beach. There's E. coli everywhere. You know, if I were to swab my room or the college, Guaranteed, I'd find E. coli on almost every surface. The question is the quantity as well, right? Uh, and the quantity for drinking water should be zero, by the way. And uh, that's what I want to talk about now. So this is kind of reiterating what I already said. We cannot test for every pathogen, but we test for something that's easy to detect, which is the coliforms. So here's the thing. It says here, total coliform does not necessarily mean that the water is contaminated. Okay? Um, because as I mentioned in the lab, 
Um, contamination is super easy, even from the technicians. So this is what the guidelines for Canadian drinking water says. It says that basically this. This is basically if you get a if you if you get a positive coliform, don't panic. Um, test the water again and test the water ten times. Do ten samples, and no more than ten percent should test positive. So they're assuming that you have a ten percent error rate is what they're basically saying. Uh, and if there's more than ten percent contaminated, then that's time to worry about the water treatment. Is really what they're saying. There are all sorts of fecal coliform tests out there. Uh, you can see here's one that I found on the internet, and it's using a, uh, what's it called, a Durham tube, which is a tiny test tube that's inverted upside down, and they're looking for uh, the production of gas, that's from the fermentation of, of lactose, and uh, all sorts of tests out there. The one that we have in the lab is a simple uh, colorized test, and uh, maybe what I will do is, uh, maybe what I, maybe actually what I'll do right now is um, I'll actually pull that up. I'll pull up the, um, the results here. So just give me a second. I've got to find that, um, that PowerPoint uh, right here somewhere. Oh no, what did I do with it? Okay, I don't, thought I had it here somewhere. Hmm. Just give me a second. I did have it. Uh, okay, I just found it. Hopefully that, uh, okay, there it is. Okay, anyway, there's a photograph of the tests we did, right? And um, so on the right is the, uh, the insert from the, um, uh, from the manufacturer. And basically they're saying if it's positive, it's gonna be yellow and there's gonna be some gas bubbles and uh, it's gonna be cloudy. And if it's a negative, um, you're gonna see, uh, see it's red, there's no gas bubbles and whatnot. So if you take a look at the labels here, number one and two are positive. And as I had mentioned before, there's no surprise. Um, well, number one is the, is the control, right? So it's actually culture E. coli. Number two is the wastewater of which um, I can't remember the recipe for the wastewater. I think I was telling you that it's, uh, it's basically, I think it's tap water, but then we throw in, um, I think we throw in a scoop of yogurt and a scoop of soil or something like that and mix it up. And uh, the yogurt and the soil are gonna have bacteria in it. And the good news is the tap water and everything else is negative. Um, sometimes we find pico coliforms in the snow, by the way. Uh, and, and sometimes we have other uh, contaminations in there. But that's what our results look like. Okay. Uh, here's another one. And uh, this is kind of similar to what you might see at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, they have these, uh, I don't know what they're called here, these uh, multi-well kits, packs, whatever. And um, what they have is, uh, it's, it's kind of like a package that you get gum in. It's got the foil on the back and, and the little plastic bubbles. And what they do is they pipette uh, a tiny amount of water, I'm not sure how, what the volume is, into the package. And uh, they can test a whole bunch of samples, right? So in this case here, we've got one, two, three, let's see here, five by about uh, eight. So you can test 40 samples there. And uh, you, you throw that in the incubator and then you, you get yellow or, or not yellow, right? So, you know, like I said, there's lots of tests out there. And this is the one we might see if we get a chance to go to the field trip this year. Okay, so that's it for fecal coliforms. Uh, there's a few other things to kind of touch around um, biology and water. Uh, one is that there are things out there that are not necessarily gonna make you sick, but they may make the water undesirable uh, in various ways, or they may have other effects. And so it's worth talking about some of these things. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, organisms out there, bacteria and protists and snails and things like that, that, that have all sorts of secretions. So for example, you can see this one here talking about a certain type of sulfur bacterium that's actually making a hydrogen sulfide, which gets converted into uh, sulfuric acid. And that can lead to corrosion of all sorts of things. Uh, there are organisms that make other deposits. So uh, biofilms, I'm not sure if you talk about biofilms in biology 108, 
but you can kind of think of that as a slime or a secretion that microorganisms are leaving on things. And of course, we don't like those things. They can leave uh, tastes and uh, they can leave odors. And so there's, there's quite a few uh, examples in that category. We want to kind of talk a little bit about, about algae uh, in here. Uh, and um, algae, of course, is uh, something that's very visible and uh, it has all sorts of um, uh, ramifications for fish and other things. Um, so a little bit of algae is not a bad thing. It's actually good for an ecosystem. Algae is, uh, is basically, uh, it's not a plant. Uh, it's, it's considered a separate kingdom. And uh, actually there's several kingdoms of algae, but basically they're photosynthetic and they're plant-like, meaning they are often green and they're making oxygen. So small amounts of, of, um, of algae is a good thing. Okay, and uh, so, if, so if you take a look here, um, here's a lake and uh, there's a dog in there and there's an algal bloom. So that's kind of a problem. So let, let's just, uh, uh, let me just, um, just give me a second here. I'm, I wanna write something. I just wanna see if I have any empty slides coming up. Uh, where is my slides? There we go. Wrong one. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Hold on a second. I'm just looking for some, because that might be the, this might be the slide to, uh, to draw on. No, no, I have an empty one coming up. Um, yeah, so you may be familiar with these algal blooms if you've seen them around. Um, I definitely I remember one year there was a massive one at, uh, at Gregoire Lake. Maybe not as bad as that dog one, but I made it in up to past my knees, uh, realizing that it wasn't getting any better. I so went deeper. It was pretty gross. So what are algae? So algae, uh, usually when biologists talk about algae, they're talking about basically photosynthetic protists. Okay, like I said, they're not plants. Plants are larger complex organisms and they have vascular systems and organs and tissues. Algae are, are typically uh, are unicellular. But they're very plant-like, right? And in many cases, they're usually closely related to plants than say animals and other things. And like I said, they can lead to all sorts of problems. Um, odor, taste, those kind of things. That's kind of gross to swim in. Uh, this is the one we want to talk about though, is that excessive growth in algae can actually lead to low dissolved oxygen. And that is a problem, that is a huge problem. Um, kind of doesn't make sense. You'd think algae are making oxygen, but uh, it has a lot to do with their depth. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, another one that is concerned in some places is sometimes uh, certain algae produce poisonous toxins. Uh, if you ever look up red tide, uh, there's a red type of algae that can produce toxins and kill all sorts of fish and stuff like that if it, if it uh, overgrows. Um, so if you think about algae, here's, here's photosynthesis, right? And uh, photosynthesis is taking uh, carbon dioxide and uh, water, and it's producing uh, you know, sugars, so starches and glucoses and things like that and producing oxygen. So we love photosynthesis because we love oxygen, right? Um, algae uh, can be encouraged to grow uh, with fertilizer, right? So if you take a look, here's our CO2, but if we start adding these things into the water sources, so phosphates and nitrates, uh, these can stimulate algae growth. And uh, in some cases, this can be a problem. So where do these things come from? These things come from basically two sources, fertilizers and fecal matter. Now you could add other things on there like shampoos and things like that can sometimes contribute to these things, but usually not as significant as fertilizers and fecal matter. And fecal matter could mean human fecal matter, or in most cases, this often means animal fecal matter in, in terms of like agriculture, right? If you have a bunch of, you, you can't have a bunch of cows, a thousand head of cow and have their manure go into a nearby river or lake. You can't do that, that's illegal because of, uh, it's gonna pollute and, and cause all sorts of algae growth. Uh, like I said, I wanna make a little flow chart on this here in a minute, um, and, uh, but show you a couple more pictures. Here's an algal bloom uh, when I visited Ontario in 2018. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, in certain places on the lake, it was pretty bad. And we're looking at, uh, in this case, I was there for about a week. And it was hot all week and not windy. It was just still. And uh, after about day four or five, suddenly all this algae started appearing. And there's my, my photograph of it. 
I think I have one or two other photographs. Uh, this is just from Google on the internet when I Googled algal bloom. There's so many different uh, places where this has happened and it can get pretty gross. Uh, often, sometimes we call this pea soup. I don't know if anyone else calls it pea soup, but sometimes I do. And I mentioned that there are some algae that are, that are, are toxic, and um, those are worth mentioning in some parts of the world. Um, so here's the question, right? How do algal blooms decrease dissolved oxygen? So this is where I want to make a little bit of a full chart, right? So think about, um, we'll start off and we'll think about a normal food chain, okay? So normal food chain we'll put over here. And then over here, we'll call this an unbalanced food chain. Okay, so in your normal uh, food chain, right? You have your phosphates and your nitrates. So phosphorus and nitrogen, right? And so these uh, work to uh, fertilize uh, algae and green plants. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so we have uh, zooplankton. So zooplankton, of course, are small uh, organisms that feed off these algae and plants. And then you have small fish feed off the zooplankton. Small fish feed off the zooplankton and you get bigger fish. So that's what we like. We like to have healthy fish. And it means a healthy aquatic ecosystem. And in some cases where you get algae blooming um, and it's not too bad, you actually get big, big fish. And the fishermen really like this, but then the people on the beach don't like it because of the algae. And so sometimes there's sort of this funny zone of where there's a lot of algae and the fish are actually quite big, particularly in large lakes because um, you can have lots of algae and still have lots of dissolved oxygen. So let's look at that unbalanced food chain, okay? And so you end up with excess uh, phosphates and nitrates, okay? So, um, and then what happens? Uh, you end up with an algal bloom. So that means you've got algae absolutely everywhere, right? And so you're still gonna get some zooplankton zooplankton and some fish. But the, uh, the side effects are, is uh, I'm just looking for space here. You can get the shoreline is gonna be choked with weeds, weeds, shoreline choked. Of course, I can't spell choked today. So the shoreline is choked with weeds. That's where it's really gross and the swimmers hate it, okay? But the other, problem is you end up with um, these things grow fast, right? And so um, the algae die quickly. So this leads to decay. And the decay, I guess I forgot a word, is aerobic. So you got all sorts of aerobic bacteria decaying these. Aerobic decay by bacteria. And these aerobic bacteria, they reduce the dissolved oxygen. So that's the problem, right? Uh, we could add other things onto here. We could add uh, bad odors, pea soup effect, whatever. You could throw in a bunch of things like that. But this is the big thing right here, okay? This is the big thing that is a concern because if you have less dissolved oxygen, you're killing fish and the whole aquatic ecosystem is less healthy. So this is why excess phosphates and nitrates are a concern and we can't be polluting our waterways. Okay, so usually that looks a little prettier on an actual whiteboard. Um, Again, sorry about my messy writing on the screen. It's just, it's just really very awkward writing on a laptop screen. So another uh, definition for you is this one here, eutrophication. So there's a new word for you. So 
if you look up eutrophication, you are going to see uh, a lot of places are defining it as a polluted waterway. It doesn't have to be polluted. Uh, eutrophication is actually a natural process. As lakes age, uh, more and more organic matter and debris get into the lake, uh, you know, over thousands of years. And um, it's just a natural kind of process. More nutrients end up in the lake and the lake gets, uh, you know, it, it changes and, and, and all that. Um, but this is the thing that we're concerned about is accelerating this process because uh, ultimately if you accelerate it too much, you're gonna to start to kill fish and whatnot, which is something we care about. We wanna have uh, healthy aquatic ecosystems. I thought I had another picture. Yeah, here we go. Here's another uh, a picture showing eutrophication, right? So it's showing the nitrogen and phosphorus and you've got the uh, phytoplankton in there and the algae bloom, they die, they decay and they, it, that sucks up the oxygen there. And that's kind of the problem, right? Uh, this is showing sources of what we might call human or cultural eutrophication. So you can see we've got, uh, we've got sewage from the city over here. We've got uh, nitrogen from cars and factories. That's not a big one, but detergents sometimes can be. Uh, we've got natural runoff. We've got a farm over here. What is this over here? Another street or something? I'm not sure what's going on over there, but lots of examples, right? And so we're trying to prevent all these things from going directly to the water and, uh, and destroy that water source. Okay, so let me just go back. I noticed, I, I know you may have noticed I skipped a couple of, of slides and I wanted to just talk a little bit about health effects of some of these algaes. Uh, there is one other type of algae we hear about a lot in Alberta. Uh, it's called the blue-green algae. And if you take a look, this is actually from Lac La Biche. I went there and saw this sign, took a photo of it for this course. And notice they even tell you what it actually is. It's not algae. <laughs> it's actually a type of cyanobacteria. So remember I was saying algae is a type of protist. It means a eukaryote. Cyanobacteria is a bacteria. It's a prokaryote. Um, but it's, they're similar in that they're photosynthetic. So cyan is a kind of a blue greenish color. And so that's where it gets the name and they're photosynthetic. And some of these forms, uh, if they overgrow, they can produce toxins. And um, different people have different amounts of uh, irritation with these. Uh, some people can go swimming and they're absolutely fine. Uh, other people, you know, they, they get, it's sort of like an allergic reaction. You get itchy eyes. And if you've, uh, if you've uh, consumed some of this water, you might get a sore throat or something like that. And in some severe cases, it's much worse. Uh, fever and headache and things like that. Um, sometimes when we have those algal blooms in Rainy Lake, um, my brother-in-law uh, is, is, seems to be sensitive to it. Uh, so he usually brings up his own water for that reason because it, it gives him a little bit of a, I can't remember how he described it. Um, he said, didn't quite say sore throat, but he used some other word, scratchy throat, maybe what he said, and makes his eyes, eyes red. Uh, so sometimes you see these warnings in certain lakes and uh, particularly if you've had a hot, sunny summer and uh, you know, the, the bacteria have a chance to kind of propagate a little bit more and you see these advisors at some lakes. Um, one thing that I wanted to say, I thought I had, yes, okay, is that um, one area that algae is a big problem is in the prairie provinces of which that would include Alberta, but more or less I'm talking about Manitoba and Saskatchewan uh, is, is a really big place, anywhere where it's flat. Uh, so think about what's going on in the prairies. You have farming everywhere, right? And farming includes you're, you're either adding fertilizer or you're adding animals and the animals are adding fecal waste and um, the, they're flat, right? And so the, eventually uh, all, that, all that fertilizer and fecal matter is gonna end up in some large water sources. Uh, here's, a, here's a picture talking about, um, about uh, somewhere near Edmonton, some, some dogs died apparently. Uh, I, uh, I can't remember actually that article as much, but I saw, thought I'd show you that picture. Uh, but one area that's really interesting to learn about is Lake Winnipeg. Um, this is an aerial photo of Lake Winnipeg. This is Manitoba right here. This is the big Manitoba border. Uh, Ontario is over there. So this is, uh, Lake Winnipeg is massive. And uh, it has a massive algae problem. Um, like I said, this is a very, very flat area and you kind of have all these streams and rivers and they all kind of slowly drain their way into Lake Winnipeg. All these farms kind of all drain into Lake Winnipeg. And there's a, um, a satellite photo showing how green it has become. 
And uh, I know people with cabins and cottages on Lake Winnipeg. And I know a couple that have had them there in the family for, for decades. And they say how much worse it gets. And in fact, they don't even like going on the beach anymore. The fishermen are really happy right now. Uh, they're pulling up massive fish. Uh, because, of course, algae is at the bottom of the food chain and the fish are massive. But uh, for swimming and re other recreational uses, it's become a lot less pleasant, apparently. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of answers to this in terms of what they can do. It's kind of an interesting story, but uh, I, I, don't, I wish I knew more about it, quite honestly. Okay, um, like I said, there's all sorts of other things out there um, that can cause uh, problems, uh, all sorts of products. Uh, that can, are made by bacteria and other organisms. And uh, this whole process we can call putrefaction, which basically means the water is stinky and doesn't taste good. And uh, a lot of these things in small amounts aren't going to hurt us. They're not bad for health in small amount, but uh, we don't want them in our water. If the water comes out of the tap and it smells bad, nobody is going to trust that water. And so these, these things have to be removed in, in water uh, treatment. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Part C is the biochemical oxygen demand. We talked about that already, so I'm just going to skip through it. And you can see there's the slides we talked about last day. And you'll be doing the calculation for, uh, for lab two, of course. And the last thing to talk about that sort of fits into this category, but really we're going to talk about it in the later half of the course, is that biological organisms are essential for wastewater treatment. Uh, and so let me just show you uh, kind of a scheme of what a wastewater treatment plant might look like. And we're going to pick this apart in details later. So you can see we're starting at the top. All of your poo and your other wastewater goes from your house. And, you know, initially it kind of gets screened out. And so they have screens that are going to remove, um, you know, toilet paper and other things that get flushed that aren't soluble and uh, grit and things like that uh, are, are going to get settled out here in this grit tank. So that's uh, sometimes, you know, uh, debris and, and gravel gets stuck in the, in the wastewater. But then all of these other steps, you can see we have a tank here, an aeration tank, a mixer, all of these uh, uh, places and a digester. All of these are basically um, areas that are being used to encourage bacteria to eat the waste. And that's it. So the big part here is number three. They add oxygen to the wastewater and the oxygen encourages aerobic bacteria to basically eat the waste, and then the bacteria sink to the bottom of the tank, and then they can be taken out. And the water is pretty clean. You do this several times, and you're looking at the water actually is much cleaner than the river water itself. Uh, it's really remarkable how 95% of what's going on at a wastewater treatment plant is just trying to encourage the right organisms to do their job. And that's about it. Um, there's a lot of details here. I'm not going to get you to worry about them at the moment. Like I said, we're going to come back into this, I don't know, topic eight or topic seven or something like that. We're going to talk about wastewater treatment. But kind of the key thing to know is bacteria and protists are good for this. And that's what it's all about. Uh, here's some examples of some different, of some different types of uh, wastewater treatment systems. This one here is called a trickling filter. So in this case here, we don't use these in Canada so much because, of course, winter. Um, but what you're looking at here, this is gravel. So basically a bunch of rocks and they spray the wastewater in it. And that's it. So what's going on? Well, the water's trickling through the gravel and uh, the, the organisms in the wastewater are going to form biofilms and little environments there. And as the water trickles through, those, those organisms are going to eat all the waste. And by the time it trickles through and goes through this a couple of times, it comes up pretty clean. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, here's, uh, here's in Fort McMurray, um, the um, aeration tanks, you can see that uh, they're kind of frothy looking because it's getting bubbled through and you can see the water comes from one direction, kind of snakes its way through these, uh, um, through these chambers and does that a few times and, and by the time it goes through these chambers, it's actually looking really good, quite remarkable. So here's the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Like I said, I'm hoping we can do the tour. I'm going to reach out to them uh, next month. And uh, we can do the tour. It will be somewhere around the end of, end of March or, or very early April. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so I have a few minutes left. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about the, um, the lab report. And uh, I just, um, hmm, <laughs> I can't find the, uh, the PowerPoint. 
started on this. But what I will do is I'll bring up an old version of PowerPoint. And um, we can talk about that. Okay, so some tips on the lab report. And I think I gave you this tip before about being descriptive when you are talking about things. So one of the things that's asking you for in the, uh, in the lab report is to give a descriptive title. Okay. Um, both of these are okay, but B is clearly better. Uh, it's just giving some more specific, you know, the word various is just, it's one of those vague words that, you know, when I read it, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Honestly, various samples. Um, do you mean samples from different taps around town? Do you mean samples from the river and the lakes around here? Like, what are you talking about? So be, be nice and specific. Okay, that's what we're looking for in the title. And titles for your tables and things like that as well. Uh, I think I talked about this already, about how it's good. Um, maybe I didn't talk about this already. Um, species names. Um, this is something David should have talked about last semester. Species names are not in English. They are in usually Latin or ancient Greek. And so they should be italicized. Uh, notice that the genus is capitalized, so E, and the species is not. And generally, they are often abbreviated, so e Escherichia coli becomes E. coli, and those kind of things. Uh, what other tips do I have? Results. Um, when reporting the data, be complete but easy to follow. So take a look. Uh, here's a couple of, um, of samples of, um, of some tables from students, okay? Uh, so these are from previous uh, lab reports. So if you take a look, A uh, has the data for hardness in silica. So notice one thing that I notice immediately over here is there's no units. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, you have to have units in there. Notice the other thing. Why does this person have two tables when you could easily have one table like this? Um, it's showing the same things, the same units. Um, it's not that hard to kind of put all this in the table. Now, in terms of how you present your data, I'm not telling you you have to present it this way. I'm just saying, don't go crazy either having too many tables and graphs and don't go crazy by having too few. You wanna find a nice way to report the data that's clean and easy to follow. Don't forget the units and don't forget to give your tables a title, right? Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be complex, uh, but basically saying, you know, what you're looking for. So dissolved ions or uh, something like that, right? Dissolved ion measurements, that actually might be complete enough for a table like that. Um, another thing about the results and the discussion is discuss your results, okay? Um, I know I have some questions there to guide you through the discussion, um, but, you know, and I think one of the questions says, you know, which of these is acceptable for drinking? And uh, this was a question that I don't have this question directly in the manual, but a lot of people, I felt you, you got to answer this. Um, there were people that says all the water supplies are acceptable for drinking except for the, uh, the brackish water. I've, I've literally had students say that. But the question is, would you really drink the wastewater? Probably not, okay? Uh, and that's worth a discussion. So like I said, take a look at the results and, and, and make sure you answer those questions. And I expect you to go a little bit beyond that in terms of kind of, uh, of your discussion. Uh, your methods, uh, as I mentioned for you, the methods section, I'm not asking you to go and write out every method for every instrument. Uh, so notice this one here on the bottom, right? I don't care about all this. I don't want to hear about how you wash the probe and how you rinse this. And you, what I want to see is every section, basically one or two sentences max. So you see the one at the top, right? Dissolve oxygen was measured for all the samples using and uh, giving the name of the meter. And then doesn't have to be in brackets, but calibrated and operated using the manufacturer's instructions. That's it. Keep it simple. If there's anything else to include, any other essential details, maybe uh, there was something uh, different than how you used it as the manufacturer described, that would be the place to include. Uh, what else do I have here? I thought I had, uh, hold on a second. Um, oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to exit the PowerPoint. Where did it go? Just lost the PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Where did it go, huh? 
think unfortunately I have some of these things are out of order, but meant to talk about all the results together. But um, so here's here's some other coliform results from another year. And uh, the other thing I want to tell you is, don't give me this photograph. I don't want the photograph of the coliform results in your in your lab report. Okay, I want you to summarize the data. Coliform results, positive or negative, right, for each of the samples. Uh, the photograph, I, I don't care. Uh, the photograph is kind of the rough data. What I want to see is the nice polished data. I have the rough data. Uh, whatever else. Um, so we didn't do this this year, but there was one year that I, uh, we had a pH kit and a pH meter. And, um, you know, the numbers were different. Right, so it's worth it to compare those kind of things. If we have any results that are duplicated, it's worth it to compare to see, you know, how did the two different methods uh, come up? Uh, what else do we have here? Referencing websites, okay? So if you take a look, there are instructions in the lab manual how I want you to do the citation. So what I want the citation to be is within the sentence of the report. So you can see there's an example there. Cite the website within the body of the report. In brackets, you're gonna put the, the source, okay? So in this case, I have Public Agency Canada. Now the reference list at the end is going to, com is going to have your complete bibliographical information. So your, um, your complete bibliographical information, what does that include? That includes the author, or in this case, the organization, right? Because the organization didn't give an author for this report. Okay, so that's, that's uh, one thing you need. Near the title of the website or the title of the report, um, the URL, so that's the web address, and then lastly, the date. So sometimes there's a date of publication. If there's no date of publication, then you can put the date that you went to that website. Okay, so do take a look. It does explain that in the lab manual, what I'm expecting for in your, in your citations. Uh, I think I talked about this already, about making special characters, so I'm not going to go on that. Um, I'm just going to finish on this as my last set of tips. Uh, it's good to be organized. It's good to have good grammar, uh, have nice sentences. Uh, if you need somebody to proofread your report, um, Dana at the Skill Center will do that for you. Okay, you can always reach out to her, and uh, they, they have that service, but they, they expect to have... Uh, a decent amount of um, warning time. You want me to look at your report. I'm not going to proofread it, but I will skim over it and you know look at it and give you some feedback, um, and uh, and then those kind of things. Anyway, this report is worth I think 14% of your grade if I remember the math correctly. Um, so it is worth it to do well on it, and um, that's why I have the consultation time tomorrow and the extra week off for everyone just to get caught up on things because. Because uh, there's a couple of reports I know that are coming from you, one for lab two and one for lab three. And uh, so make sure you use that time wisely, okay? You have three extra hours tomorrow morning of your life. Um, use them on this report and try not to do it all in one sitting. See if you can, you know, try to do it over a few nights. Anyway, I noticed I went over time. I apologize for that. I will, uh, I will end this now and you'll have lots of time tomorrow to ask me any questions about the report.